doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. I'd be interested to get your view about how sovereign wealth funds could work with philanthropies to solve some of these issues that uh, uh, Gunter's talking about and, and form new institutional investor public partnerships uh, with governments to deliver new and ambitious uh, infrastructure uh, NDC aligned investments. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you. Um, I gave you the shortest question, by the way. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Yes. Um, a, a couple of things. Firstly, just my immediate reaction to what Gunter says. What could possibly go wrong with um, uh, you know, some uh, Europeans coming in and owning some of Africans' uh, key economic assets? Um, I'm sure that would be popular. Not. So, um, so you know, logic is, is one thing, real, political reality is another, is what I'd say. You want to take that into account. But look, let me quickly just go back to what Rich was saying uh, about, uh, and about allocation, just to throw you some, a bit of good news. So, latest data that we have from sovereign wealth funds is that, yes, they are allocating more to emerging markets, precisely because of the di diversification risk. Uh, that, that we've got there. Also, they are most positive about um, after Amer the U.S. economy, about the Amer about the African economy in general as being having the most growth. So there is some good news that we've got in there, and also um, the latest we've got from when it comes to climate-related investment. Then sovereign wealth funds certainly find Africa the most popular continent in terms of where they favour putting those investments. It is also the least popular continent. So it's got those two extremes. So there's a, a polarization among funds. So I think that, that actually says um, uh, something. But then let's go into the, uh, around, around the risks. And, uh, and most of you will think of uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds as those big, as I've mentioned before, the, um, the, the Gulf funds or the Singaporeans, people like that, or the Norwegians. But, uh, and, and there's a lot of uh, significant amounts of capital there. But what in Africa is also happening is there's a number of uh, strategic development funds that have been uh, that have been started. Some have got dual mandates, so a save as well, but some will invest domestically. And key among those is to both de-risk projects, uh, but also to um, uh, to help their capital markets grow and develop, because that's another crucial point uh, for this. And if you take somewhere like Nigeria, is a good example where the uh, Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. Um, it's got a savings mandate, but it's also got uh, a domestic mandate uh, as well. It's helped to fund and build the uh, second uh, uh, Niger crossing. Uh, it's also uh, created um, some institutions designed to stimulate its local market. And of course, Nigeria, 235 million population, it's got a very significant uh, amount of uh, local capital. Whether that goes to work in the best possible ways is, um, yeah, is, is uh, debatable. But uh, NSIA has developed um, Carbon Vista, a joint venture between uh, themselves and, uh, and VITOL to invest in carbon uh, 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 emission reduction. The Green Guarantee Company it's invested in, which uh, is providing long-term guarantees to credit, uh, enhanced debt instruments, and also they've got their renewable energy investment platform. That's just one fund doing that in the Nigerian market. I could point to Senegal, where Fonsis has done a, a really excellent job attracting capital and building renewable energy um, uh, projects, or you can look at Gabon, where they are actually leading their discussion over nature-based solution and investing in the uh, uh, in those forests for sustainability. So, and across a number, and there's and there's a number of other geographies I could mention in t in terms of that. So, what you're seeing is that African certain African countries are understanding that they need a they need to speak the language of investors, uh, and they need to have a very clear vehicle. Um, that will uh, that will lead into those investments and will help de-risk it politically. But I think just as important, it will speak the right language for investors, which is about how they understand to get returns uh, over a long period. And then the final thing I will leave you with is the time horizon for sovereign wealth funds. So the average time horizon for a sovereign wealth fund, so is ten years, and in some cases it's it's much more than that. It even goes up to fifty. So they can look at this in the long term. So they are very sensible partners to have. But 
the individual countries need to make it as attractive as possible. And we are seeing pockets of progress, in, and indeed probably more than that. Um, and the final one I'll, I'll give you is th that I should is a, a, su a success story, which is um, QIA uh, and Enel, the, uh, the Italian company. They've got 730 megawatts of, uh, in development of re uh, green energy uh, across Zambia and South Africa. They recently just signed uh, a big offtake part uh, contract with uh, Liquid uh, in South Africa for green, uh, for green energy. So there's some real progress is being made. No, thank you very much, uh, Duncan. And, and, and effective, you've just been giving concrete examples of institutional investor public partnerships where African sovereign funds have effectively been the agents for government uh, to actually go out there and, and then co-invest with peers, um, speaking the language, being the institution that it has aligned terms and aligned fiduciary uh, responsibilities and perspectives. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.